Welcome to our introduction to participles. I often tell the Greek students that there are three main categories we want to make sure we have a good grasp on but by the time we leave first year Greek and that is nouns and how they function, how they form, same for verbs, and same for participles. These are the three big categories within Greek that form the base of the language. So I hope this introduction will help us get, start to get a pretty good grasp on how these participles work. When we parse nouns, we parse them looking at their case, number, and gender. And for the verbs, we want to identify person and number, tense, voice, and mood. The only overlap between these two is the number, and that's because they have different functions, and so they're, they're parsed differently. They have different categories. For instance, if we parse logos, we would say nominative singular masculine from logos, and it means word. Or if we uh, parse lege, we'd say it's third singular, present active indicative, from lego, and it means he, she, or it speaks. The participle is a verbal word that connects nouns and verbs. Generally, the participle is going to be translated in English as whatever the verb is, plus the suffix ing. So let's use an analogy that might help us appreciate and understand these participles. Generally, when someone builds a bridge, it's to connect two pieces of land that aren't connected there, or at least maybe 10 or 15 or even more miles north or south. And usually what a bridge does is it increases the transit or the flow of traffic. And so people from one end can get to the other end who before couldn't, there was no connection. Participles connect verbs and nouns in order to increase, we could say, the fullness of expression. The participle is a verbal adjective that shares certain features with verbs and with nouns. Let's take a quick look at the different forms. Uh, the masculine and neuter participles are going to follow the third declension. If you remember a few lessons ago when we talked about third declension nouns, we found that um, the stem of third declension nouns ends in a consonant rather than a vowel, and that affects the endings. They're going to take third declension endings. The reason these, these participles are third declension is because of the participle morpheme that is a new tau. It's the new tau in the word that tells us it's functioning as a participle. Similar to the tense formative in verbs and how it tells us what the tense is, the new tau is going to tell us that it is a participle. Well, this is the last part of the stem of the word. So because the morpheme ends in a tau, the whole the stem of the word ends in a tau, and they follow the third declension formation patterns. We'll be looking at this more later. And the feminine participle is going to follow the first declension pattern. The tense morpheme, or I'm sorry, the participle morpheme is usa or use. And that means it's going to follow the, the first declension because the stem ends in an alpha or in an eta. When we studied third declension, we also talked about the importance of looking at the genitive singular because that will show us the whole stem of the word. So if we look at the genitive and we compare it with the nominative singular here, they look pretty different. Well, that's because there's in the nominative singular, there's usually a contraction or a letter might drop out, something like that. The genitive singular, the whole stem will appear plus the ending, something that happens in the majority of all of these forms. So a participle increases the fullness of expression of a sentence in Greek. And as a verbal adjective, the participle will sometimes function more as a verb, and other times it will function a little more as an adjective. It can do both. Let's talk about how the participle is like a verb. The participle forms from the verbal stem, and it has tense, aspect, and voice. When we say tense, we're talking about the fact that it can form from the present, aorist, or perfect tense. Remember the aorist is marked by the sigma alpha, the perfect is marked by the kappa alpha. And uh, we remember what these tenses mean too. The present is continuous, the aorist is undefined, and the perfect is past action with continuous results. Aspect. Uh, the, the aspect of a participle will not indicate time in and of itself. Indicative verbs do a better job of indicating time. The participle won't do that so much. The time of a participle will actually be indicated by the main verb, or the indicative, which it is modifying. The participle functions like the sidekick of that main verb. And so it's kind of riding on the time, which is indicated by the indicative. It doesn't um, portray time by itself.
There might be some rare instances where that happens, but generally the time needs to be determined by the indicative which it is modifying in the context. The action will either be continuous and definite or perfective, which is a past action continuous results. And voice, it could be active, middle, or passive. As far as the function in translation goes, when it functions a little more like a verb, it's not going to have the article. And if we look at the context, we'll find that it's more essential to the verb, to the meaning of the verb in the context, than it is to the noun to which it refers. So if it doesn't have the article, it's going to be functioning a little more like a verb. Let's take a look at these. Uh, the present tense, luantos esosen. That would be translated. This is a loose translation. There's other possibilities. Loosing, or we could even say while loosing, because often it indicates contemporaneous time, he saved. Or the aorist, lusantos. Okay, so now if we look at the form of the aorist, we see the new tau, uh, participle morpheme, plus the, the sigma alpha tense formative, the aorist tense formative, plus the verb. After loosing, he saved. Or the perfect, lelukatos esosen, having loosed, he saved. What we're saying is when it functions a little more like a verb, it's going to be more essential to the meaning of the verb than it is to the noun that it might be modifying. In this case, then the understood noun would be he, he saved. But we need to understand the participle in this sense to get a better understanding of the verb. Only rarely does the participle function like an independent verb, but it can do it. Every once in a while, it does. Uh, if it's standing all by itself, if we saw luantos, we might translate it as he looses or he is loosing. The aorist might be translated as he loosed. Or the perfect, he has loosed. The participle can also function as an adjective. As an adjective, it will have case number and gender. Many times, the participle modifies a noun in the context with which it agrees in these three ways. It will always agree in case, number, and gender. Because the stem ends in a consonant, remember the, the participle morpheme is nu tau, the forms are going to follow the third declension. So let's take a look at this one more time. We're talking about ways in which the participle is a little more like a noun or like an adjective. If we look at the nominative singular, or in the neuter it would be the nominative and accusative singular, or the dative plural, the new tau participle morpheme has dropped out. The nominative singular masculine is luon, while the tau dropped out, and there was a contraction ends up being luon. And over in the neuter, it's just luant, because in the third declension neuter, there's technically no ending. And tau cannot stand at the end of a word, so it just drops off, and we end up with luon. And the dative plural, the square of stops, the new drops out, tau meets sigma, uh, and it becomes luusin. Now don't confuse the dative plural with the third plural present active indicative luusin. They look exactly the same but it'll have to be the context that um, determines the difference. These are characteristics that we've already seen when we studied third declension nouns. So the stem of the participle would be lu, the connecting vowel would be omicron, the participle morpheme would be nu tau and this is the genitive form uh, and then the ending would be omicron sigma, luantos. So we'd parse it as genitive singular, it could be masculine or neuter, present active participle, and the lexical form is going to be from a verb, because the participles form from a verb, and we can put as the translation loosing, or perhaps while loosing is a good keyword for the present participle. So as we parse it out, we see that it shares characteristics with nouns and with verbs. Because the stem of the feminine participles ends in a vowel, they're going to follow the first declension. So uh, the way it breaks down is it would be the stem, the connecting vowel, not needed because the vowel is actually included in the participle morpheme, use in this case, and the ending for the genitive singular would be sigma. Luuses would be parsed as a genitive singular feminine, present active participle, lexical form luo, and again the translation would be loosing. Let's take a minute to consider the function and translation of these participles when they function as an adjective. 
Uh, if it's functioning more like an adjective, it could be attributive or substantive. I know it's been a little while since we've talked about adjectives, but attributive means it's modifying a noun in the context, and substantive means it's standing alone. When it functions this way, it will normally have the article. And there's the main difference. When it's functioning more like an adjective, it will have the article. If it's functioning more like a verb, it won't. If it's attributive, it's going to be modifying a noun in the context with which it will agree in case, number, and gender. So we want to look at the endings to figure out what's modifying what. And then the substantive, this is when the participle will be all alone. So an example of the present participle when it's functioning like an attributive would be tu andros tu luantos. This would be translated of the man who loses. An aorist would be tu andros tu lusantos, of the man who loosed. And the perfect, tu andros tu le lukotos, of the man who has loosed. Often the participle will function as a substantive, like we said. So if it's all by itself, it will uh, generally have the article, tu luantos, of the one who looses. And notice how we keep the key word of the case, this is the genitive case, and we'll generally keep the key word in the translation of the one who looses. Uh, when we do that, we often need to provide the understood noun or pronoun from the context. We're assuming that this is maybe a man or a person of the one who looses. These are things that we need to include in the translation that are simply understood in the Greek. The aorist would be tu lusantos, of the one who loosed, and the perfect tu lelukatos, of the one who has loosed. In all of these forms, we would keep the keyword. So participles are verbal adjectives that can connect verbs and nouns in order to increase the fullness of expression. It's a verbal adjective that shares certain features with verbs and nouns.